Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Come on in, find your seats. Glad that you can uh, join us this morning. Good to see so many people here and so many young people. Um, really glad that you guys could be here uh, this morning. Um, my name is Craig Warner. I'm the kids pastor here. If you're newer to First Baptist, I'm glad you could join us. We've got um, we're kicking off our, our new 9 a.m. training hour set of classes today, um, and this is the kids and tech class. Uh, so hopefully you guys grabbed a, um, a binder on the way in. Um, we, had, we had quite a few people sign up, but as it goes, we always have more people come that actually sign up. So if you're one of those people that didn't sign up, go put your binder back right now, and you <laughs> make sure that someone who signed up gets your binder. Uh, no, we'll have, we'll have more if we need it um, in the weeks to come. Um, but... Um, but let me just say that, that we're glad that you're here. We obviously believe that this is a big topic um, that we have to address. And so, really, whatever your reason for being here is, um, maybe you have kids who are about to start using tech. Maybe they're um, starting to get to that age where you're starting to see their interaction with it. Maybe you have teenagers who are already immersed in technology. Um, maybe your family's already been hurt by the effects of technology and, and social media. And, um, you're just trying to figure out what to do. You're just kind of reeling and not sure what to do next. But whatever, whatever the case is, we're, we're glad you're here. And, uh, just understand that a lot of the stuff that we cover is going to seem overwhelming. I know that I felt that way. I know Josh feels that way. We've been doing research for this. Uh, it can feel overwhelming. It can, it can be scary. Uh, that's not our intention. That's just gonna, that's just gonna be a byproduct of talking about this subject. Um, that's not our intention. Uh, but wherever you are, um, if you don't know where to begin, um, if you if you're looking for some info, maybe to help help uh, help lay a foundation um, to to begin using technology in a healthy way with your family uh, and, and creating a, a healthy relationship with media. Um, Maybe you think that the damage has already been done and, and your kids can't go back on what they've been exposed to. Uh, just understand that it's never too late to make improvements. And so wherever you are uh, on this spectrum of the use of technology and the influence of media in our lives, um, just know that, that you can always take steps to, to make things better, to improve things, to, to heal things, um, to fix things, whatever it is. Um, so in this class, we're not going to ask you to ditch all screens and start making your own clothes, okay? Nothing like that. Um, not all tech is bad, right? So I'm assuming that most of us got here this morning by the use of technology. Um, I almost didn't make it this morning. Darn technology. I go out to start my car, and uh, I wouldn't turn over. So I was like, oh, man, I, I was already, I wanted to get here early, make, things, make sure things were set. So I was like, well, I'll just jump it real quick. I go to start my wife's van. And it won't turn over either. <laughs> so I called Troy. It's like, have you left for the church yet? Like, Pastor Troy, will you come pick me up? <laughs> um, so he said, yeah. He said, yeah, I'm leaving. I'll be leaving now. So while I was waiting, I was like, well, I'll go try one more time. And so I tried, and it, and it turned over. And then the van turned, o- turned over. So anyways, not all tech is bad, although most of the time it's frustrating. Uh, uh, but... Um, you know, thanks to tech, we were able to prepare for this class. There was, there was a lot of research that had to be done. Um, I know for me, if I had to, to, to read all of those books with my eyeballs, uh, I would not be able to get as much information thanks to the, the use of audiobooks and being able to plug into my car and put headphones in while I'm doing other stuff. I was able to do a lot of research for this class, ebooks that you can search uh, that are available to us uh, in an instant download. I didn't have to go and try to remember how to use the Dewey Decimal System at the library or anything like that. Um, but we're hoping that through this class, we'll be able to utilize tech um, to help shape how we utilize tech, if that makes sense. All right? Uh, will we encourage you to limit screen, screen use? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but our goal, again, isn't to scare you, although some of what we cover will be scary. We ultimately want to help you, and we believe that together, with God, we can find a balance in our tech use that ultimately glorifies Him. Um, You have the church, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. All throughout history, every issue that any parent has ever faced, um, that has been the solution to it. Um, And so while our time and our challenges may seem unprecedented, it may seem unique to us, and in some degree that's true, uh, but the truth is we have all that we need. We have the church, we have each other, 
We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we have the Word of God um, to go to. So just keep that in mind, okay? Don't overreact. Don't freak out. Um, let's, let's approach this um, sober-mindedly. Um, I know when it comes to our kids, we're very protective, and, and some of the stuff that we, we learn is, is going to be very scary. Um, but let's do our best to, to uh, approach things uh, in, in prayer and, and with, with a sober mind. Okay? So the goal for this class, in your notes, this class will address several aspects of how technology affects our kids in today's screen-saturated world. We will talk candidly about social media, smartphones, TV, gaming, pornography, and the threat of addiction to all the above. We'll also provide some tech tips and alternatives to help parents and kids fight this epidemic of constant connectedness. Our hope is that through this class, you'll be able to manage media's influence in your family and establish a healthy relationship with technology. All right, there may be no issue more relevant to our families today than the impact of technology. We hope that parents and their kids will take this class together. So for those of you that are here with your, with your kids, that's great. Um, maybe, maybe your kids couldn't be here. Maybe your kids are younger. Um, maybe they're still elementary age. Um, that's okay. They don't need to hear some of what we're talking about anyways, but this will be good, uh, good for you to know. Um, maybe, maybe you're a kid here and your parents couldn't, couldn't make, and I'm glad, I'm glad that you're here at least, and hopefully you'll be able to get a perspective uh, on how this impacts our lives. Um, I believe that the best thing we can do is uh, to prepare and to protect our kids from the effects of tech is to simply talk to them. So if anything else, through this class, you'll get plenty of information, you'll get plenty of topics to discuss with them, just starting the conversation and continuing that conversation uh, is, is going to have probably the, the biggest impact than, than anything else, okay? Uh, so even when they're young, uh, even when they're young, start discussing because tech is everywhere. And if they're not using it, you're using it at least. And so even, even beginning to talk to them about how you use it uh, will go, we'll go a long way. So we hope to provide some knowledge. So there's some things maybe that you didn't know that you'll know through this class, some understanding. So when we look at the way kids use tech and, and some of the effects on it, uh, hopefully we'll get a better understanding of, of why that is. Uh, and then hopefully uh, you'll also get some wisdom. So you'll be able to apply what we learn here in this class. Okay? So parents, if it feels like we're scolding you, it's just because we want you to feel bad with us. Okay? <laughs> so again, a lot, of, a lot of conviction has taken place before even uh, today started just with, with uh, my own tech use and uh, and the way we use it in our family, and so I want you, I want you to hurt with me. Um, kids, if it feels like we're trying to ruin your life, um, it's just because we're trying to help you, and we're trying to, to, to shelter you from some of the harmful effects of technology, okay? So keep that in mind. If we start yelling, if we start pointing fingers, if we start getting excited, um, just know that it's because it's, it's already taking place uh, in our hearts, in our lives. There's a, a schedule there that you can see. Uh, that schedule is subject to change, but um, if you're just wondering what the topics will be, um, there you can, uh, you can see that. I do want you to, to notice there at the very end, uh, week 10 on February 20th, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, and so there are Q&A cards right outside these doors. There's, there's two little tables sitting right out here. So if you have any questions, um, fill one of those out, drop it in the, uh, drop it in the, the little box out there. And, um, we'll, we'll, if we don't address them throughout the weeks, as we cover different topics, uh, we'll try to at least address them during that, that final week. Okay. So take advantage of that. Uh, and really that helps us see what kind of struggles you're facing in your family. Cause, cause again, for, for Josh and I, uh, our kids are younger uh, Josh works with high school, uh, but they're not his kids, and um, so sometimes we just might not be aware of all that, and so that'll, that'll just help us as we prepare to, to, to be able to focus on all the needs. We also hope to, to use Facebook, um, so you can see the Facebook group there, uh, facebook.com slash groups slash kids plus tech, uh, and so we'll be posting more information there. This is for parents. We'll be posting more information there. Uh, we'll have discussion there. Uh, following up with stuff, more resources, all that. So I'd encourage you to find that group, uh, make sure you join. And uh, if you have questions too, you can share them there. If you're looking for you know, a little crowdsourcing um, to get some input from people, that's a good place to do it. Okay? Uh, we'll be talking about technology and media quite a bit, so let's define those terms. Technology are the methods, systems, and devices which are the result of scientific knowledge being used for practical purposes, problem-solving, 
or inventing useful tools. All right. Um, so you think of you think of tech, you think of how that applies to a lot of different things. Um, that, that would actually be a good conversation to have with your kids, especially younger kids. Um, just give them this definition, give them an understanding of what technology is, and then ask them where they can spot technology being used. Uh, that's just a good way to start the conversation. Uh, it's harmless. It's easy. Uh, you know, it's it's it, it can be it can be entertaining. Um, so 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 try that on your kids. The other definition is media, which is the communication channels through which we uh, disseminate news, music, movies, education, promotional messages, and other data. All right, so media is everywhere, and it's getting thrown at us every day. The the word media, it it comes from the word, or it basically means middle. Okay, so media means middle. And when you think about it, when you think about the different types of media that we consume, you have an author, author writes a book, and then there's a reader, right? So the author is the creator, the book is the media, and then the reader is the audience. You have a composer, a song, and a listener. You have a director, you have a movie, and you have a viewer. You have an influencer, you have an app, and you have a user, okay? So the ironic thing, though, about this definition, as media means middle, is it's true in more ways than one. It's not just what comes between us and the creator. It's not something that, that comes between us there. But media is really, it's at the center. It's in the middle of our lives, right? We're focused on it all the time. Um, we have smartphones in our pockets. We have TVs in the middle of our living room. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's in the middle of our lives. It's the focus of our lives. But media has also truly come between us in a lot of ways. Media has come in the middle of us. If you look around a restaurant on almost any given night, and you see families sitting at the same table, but they've got something that's coming in between them. Everybody's on their phones. Or maybe even in your own living room, uh, when you sit down for the night with your kids, there's something that's coming in between us, and it's, it's media. It's not difficult to see the way that unchecked technology is shaping us and our relationships. It's impacting us and our kids, and that's why we thought this class was crucial to do. We have to approach the influence of media in our lives intentionally because default leaves us staring into our screens all day while the world around us fades to black. All right, so the next section there, differing perspectives. So again, we're coming in here as parents trying to help our kids, or maybe you're coming in here as a kid hoping that your parents will get a clue or something on technology. And so the reason that there's this big gap is because we have differing perspectives. And so let's just take a look at what some of those are. The first one is analog versus digital. So when it comes to technology and media, we've, inter we've introduced a, a couple of new words in recent years that were not applied to technology in the majority of its existence, and that is social and digital. All right? So when we think of analog technology... Our minds might think of radio, 8mm cameras, rotary phones, indestructible TV sets. Um, that, was, that TV set became then the TV stand when my dad got a flat screen, right? <laughs> so we have this giant tube TV, and it's 500 pounds, and then you get a flat screen. So what do you do? You just set it on top of that, right? <laughs> so that's, what, that's what maybe what we think of. Analog is just the polite way of saying your grandma's outdated devices, Okay. But it also includes things that we grew up on, like CDs, Super Nintendo, and dare I even say Blu-ray players, right? But you're thinking, but it's, but it's ultra high definition. How can that be analog? How can that be outdated? Um, but these are physical, standalone components, okay? That's the idea of, of analog, is it's, it's a standalone component. When we refer to digital media and technology... We're talking about a network of computers, video games, smartphones, tablets, uh, wearables. So you think like a smartwatch or uh, Google Glass, those glasses. I think Amazon actually has a pair now. I'm not sure what they're called. Uh, but you got smart home products. Um, you got a whole slew of other interactive devices that connect to the internet. So that's what we're talking about when we, when we refer to digital media or technology. And while on the surface, our old media may seem similar to its digital counterparts, there's actually fundamentally different principles that guide their use. Our digital media of today is designed and it even demands that we interact with it. What has been so tricky for parents is that the move from analog to digital for us requires a paradigm shift. 
right? It's not like we're going from cassette tapes to CDs, right? It's still kind of in the same line there. It's just, a, it's just a different form of technology, but we're switching from analog technology to digital technology. The analogy that author Kara Powell uses is we haven't just upgraded our baseball bat from wood to aluminum, we started playing hockey instead, okay? So this is why kids' use and infatuation with technology is so confusing for us parents. It's because it's a, it's a, whole, new, it's a whole new ball game or a, a whole new puck game, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> a new sport, right? It's a whole new game. We have our perspective on technology and the conclusions we've come to, but we can't assume that our kids view things the same way that we do because digital technology is inherently immersive and interactive. And here's the thing, that's all they've known. That's all they've known. And that brings us to the next uh, differing perspective, which is immigrant versus native. Have you guys heard those terms before, digital immigrant versus digital native? Show of hands. You guys heard them? All right, so some people... As adults, we have the benefit of knowing the world both with and without digital media, but our kids will never understand that, all right? Like most immigrants, and that's the parents, we're digital immigrants. Like most immigrants, we bring baggage from our pre-digital world, namely some of the expectations we have about why and how people use media. We may use digital technology ourselves today and feel like it's home for us in some ways. We've gotten used to it. We've adapted but in reality, we will never be as fully steeped in digital culture as our kids. Think about an actual immigrant that moves to another country. There's a great deal of culture shock. There's a lifetime of adjusting, and even though they may become comfortable, they're never, they'll never be as comfortable in their new land as someone who was born and raised there. And that's our kids. Our kids are born and raised in this digital age. As adults, we have to adjust to strange languages, norms, and practices. Although we may adapt to the social, social nature of digital technology, our kids have never known a world where media meant not participating. For us, consuming media in the past was fairly passive. We would receive words, images, or sounds. We would sit and read a book made out of paper. We would relax and watch a movie on the couch, push a play and enjoy a song. It was only social insofar that we watch a movie with someone or we discuss a book that we read in our book club or with someone at work, or we sing along to our favorite song with our friends in the car. However, we may view digital media as more interactive now than when we were younger, but our kids lack that comparison, and their world, uh, in their world, media requires interaction. The new paradigm created from this technological shift from analog to digital has created a new kind of digital citizen, and it requires a new perspective because there's a whole new set of questions and solutions involved. And it's not as clear for our kids as it once was for us. All right? So that's why, that's why I, I, again, I think this, this class is important for us to cover these topics. It's like we've all set sail for this brave new world, but we're lost at sea. Us parents can remember what it's like to live on solid ground, but our kids were born on the boat. And while these seas we navigate are unchartered to some degree, the desire of our children is the same of every other child from the beginning of time. So keep that in mind. They want to grow up safe. They want to grow up happy. They want to grow up loved. And that's something that only you can provide, whether you understand this digital world or not. So while all these stats and studies we'll throw at you during this class have been done on kids, Remember, they haven't been done on your kid. You are responsible for raising your own children. The goal of this class is to help you and your kids. So focus on what we know. Understand that technology will play some role in your life, but don't let it come between you. All right? Don't let it be the center. <clears throat> the next differing perspective is a tool versus a toy. Since technology and media are ubiquitous, that means it's everywhere, and there's no escaping it, we have to get a grasp on how we view it and what role we'll allow it to play in our lives, and more importantly, how we introduce it to our children. Sometimes its impact hits us so fast that we don't have time to build a proper perspective on technology's purpose, right? There's things are changing every day, and there's new technology here and there, and we start implementing it without thinking about what kind of role it's playing in our lives. So we end up, what we end up doing is we give it to our kids because of the immediate results we get, right? So... Again, you're at the restaurant, you're driving in the car, or whatever, your kid's bugging you, you hand them your phone, and we get some immediate results from that, from giving them this toy. They're occupied, 
They're happy. And most importantly, they're not bothering us. Right? (laughs) But we fail to see what's happening beneath the surface. For the long-term effects are still unknown, but our kids are having fun. Right? So we, we give them technology and we introduce it as a toy. And what we inadvertently do is introduce technology to our kids as that, as a toy. The TV becomes the babysitter. Our smartphone becomes their pacifier. We even say things like, hey, go play on your tablet. Or here, be quiet, sit here and play on my phone. Right? By doing this, we have set the precedent for our kids that tech is for their consumption. It's for their entertainment. It's all about making them happy. If we train them to believe that it's a toy for their pleasure, then they go through life with this perspective and they find their purpose and desire in fulfillment in technology and all that it offers instead of using technology as a tool to find those things. If we introduce it as a toy to our kids, tech becomes the focus. If we introduce it as a tool, tech becomes a means. Right, a means to an end, a, a way for them to accomplish something, to, to do something. Not only that, but as we'll see in weeks to come, there's some inherent harm that comes with technology. And putting it in front of our small children too early with no supervision or restrictions is careless. So, for illustration's sake, I brought a tool today, okay? And some of you might be looking at it thinking, if there's anybody that wants to get rid of their smartphone this morning... We can take care of that before you leave, okay? No, but I have a power saw here, a circular saw, a skill saw, whatever you want to call it. This is dangerous. You would never give this to a kid and say, here, play with this, leave me alone, right? You would never do that. No, if you want your child to use it properly, there's some training involved. There's some guidelines you need to put in place, and there's an example that you need to set. Show them how to use it properly, all right? You know what? There's a lot of work that can be done with a power tool. There's a lot of progress that can be made. A lot of creation can take place. And in the hands of a skilled craftsman, there's a lot that they can contribute. All right? So I got the Built Brothers right here in front of me. All right? Garrett and Landon. All right? And these guys, how often do you guys Every day? Almost every day? Every week for sure? Right? And there's a lot that they can accomplish with this tool. But they're skilled with it. They've had training. They, They know the proper way to use it. And so, <clears throat> there's a, they contribute a lot. You put it in the hands of someone less mature, without proper training or without the proper perspective of its use and its purpose, there's a lot of damage that can be done, right? So we need to introduce technology to our kids as a tool, not as a toy. So you can do this by waiting until the proper time in your child's life, not too early, I would say the longer you can hold out, the better, to be honest. By giving them proper instructions, guidelines, and a purpose of technology, and then by showing them yourself how to use it properly. Parents, you have to set the example of how tech is used in your life because that sets the example of how tech will be used in your kids' lives. All right? That means you're not always behind a screen. That means you're not finding your fulfillment and pleasure in your phone. And when you do use it properly, talk about it with your kids. Say, oh, sorry, I'm on my phone for a minute. I'm just looking up a recipe for tonight's dinner. Or do you know what would really blow their minds? If you pulled out a cookbook and looked up a recipe for dinner. <laughs> right? That would be ridiculous. <laughs> <clears throat> or you could say, oh, sorry, I'm Googling how to fix the sink. Or I'm looking up a verse in my Bible app that I was reminded of today. Talk about how you're using text so your kids don't just see you on your phone all the time. And those times that you do have it out in front of them, hopefully you're not just playing some game and ignoring them but you're talking about how you're using it, right? Set the example for them. <clears throat> how you set the example for your kids for the role of tech in your, in your life is the foundation to everything that we'll build on in the course of this class, okay? If, if you can't set that example, then, um, then everything else that we, we, we share with you and teach you, um, you're not going to be able to put it into practice because they're going to see you, how you use it, and they're going to say, well, that's how I'm going to use it too, Right? So you gotta, you got you to gotta follow your own guidelines. <clears throat> All right, next is a little tech timeline. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, we're, really, we're laying the foundation for everything else. We want to give you guys some understanding. And so we're kind of preparing 
uh, the bigger picture. So as we move forward, you can really see what's at play here. All right, so let's take a look at this tech timeline. In the past, we, think of, uh, we typically think of technology as screens, gadgets, and gizmos that are so prevalent in our world today, excuse me, prevalent in our world today. However, based on our definition of technology, we can look back and see the impact of tech all throughout history, right? Some of the major inventions include things like tools, even the most rudimentary tools, <clears throat> the wheel, and then the big one is the printing press. In the 15th century, Johann Gutenberg um, created the, uh, or implemented the printing press, invented the printing press. You know what the first book is he printed? Bible. The Bible, all right? The Bible. So again, not all tech is bad. Printing press not only made writing uniform and repeatable, but its subsequent impact is nearly endless from how we communicate to how, how and what we can build, even how we think. Truly an earth-shattering invention. Not all tech is bad. Now let's look at the, uh, the ages of the past. <clears throat> so there's the agricultural age. So this is where um, you know, they used uh, farming and, and uh, domesticating animals to raise them as food. Um, you know, it's how most of the world lived for the majority of, of history. And then we come into the industrial age, and this transformed economies that had been based on agricultural, agriculture and handicrafts uh, into economies based on large-scale industry, mechanized manufacturing, and the factory system. New machines, new power sources, and new way of organizing work made existing industries more productive and efficient. Uh, and then the information age, which began in the mid-20th century, characterized by a rapid shift from the traditional industry established by the Industrial Revolution to an economy primarily based upon information technology. It's the modern age regarded as a time in which information has, has become a commodity that is quickly and widely disseminated and easily available, especially using computer technology. Okay? So... Uh, really, since the 1980s, there has just been a deluge of information. Uh, I, I refer to it as the instant age. Okay, So at, at, at any moment, we can look up any bit of information that, that we want. right? Um, not only that, but that's, that's, that's played into so many, different, so many different things. right? We have Amazon Prime. We can download movies that are in theaters now uh, at the click of a button. We can get anything we want instantly. And, and, and don't tell me that hasn't affected our kids or our society in the way that we think and the way that we behave and the things that we expect, okay? But um, the information age, really since the, the 1980s, um, we have so much info, we don't know what to do with it all. We don't know how to handle it all. So for example, the Encyclopedia Britannica. How many kids have heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica? Okay, some, okay. So the first edition was published in 1771, required only one editor, three volumes in about 2,500 pages to encapsulate nearly everything thought to be worth knowing. Okay? Today, it's almost irrelevant. It's been replaced by Wikipedia. How many of you have heard of Wikipedia? Okay. Don't use that when you're writing your papers. Okay? Which features an endless and perpetual expansion of articles um, now reaching well into the millions in this space, there's no single editor who determines what stays and what goes, okay? So imagine, imagine that. Anyone can contribute to Wikipedia. Isn't that great news? Any old Joe Schmo out there with no education can be feeding your Wikipedia entries, all right? Keep that in mind, <clears throat> right? So information has just blown up in, in recent history. But here's the thing about each of those ages. Each age had its own benefits, there were pros to it. There were good things that came of it. Each age had its own challenges. There were, there were cons to it. Each age was met with resistance. Uh, how many of you parents who have ever been called a Luddite? Anybody? Uh, okay, we got a couple. How many of you kids know what a Luddite is? Okay, just a, just a couple. How many of you parents know what a Luddite is? Okay, all right, just a few. Okay, well, here's, the, here's, here's what a Luddite so a Luddite, so back in the industrial uh, age, the Luddites were a secret oath-based organization of English textile workers. Um, they had a radical faction which destroyed textile machinery through protest. The group are believed to have taken their name from Ned Ludd, who was a weaver that destroyed two stocking frames in a fit of rage. Okay, so here's this guy who, who's, who's a weaver, right, is a tradesman, a craftsman. And uh, a stocking frame was making what he did easier to do. And so he, he got 
upset and destroyed them. And so this created this secret oath-based organization, the Luddites, who, who protested manufacturers who used machines because they feared that the time spent learning the skills of their craft would go to waste as machines would replace their role in the industry. Over time, the term has come to mean one opposed to industrialization, automation, computerization, or new technologies in general. Okay? So, the industrial age saw the resistance. Um, our age today is seeing resistance, so if you ever get called a Luddite, you have a little bit of an understanding there of what that means. Okay? But here's the thing. Each age persevered. Each age continued, and it grew into the next one. So in your notes, we will not be able to stop the progress of our current culture, and we certainly won't be able to reverse it. We must learn how to mitigate its effects, harness its power, and redeem its purpose. Okay? So again, we're not going to tell you to get rid of every screen in, in your house, right? Um, that's silly, because technology is, is everywhere. And so we have to know how to use it properly. We have to be able to, to harness it. And we have to protect our kids from the harm that can come with it as well because this, this age is moving forward, right? We're, we're, all other ages have been met with resistance and they didn't get stopped. And this one's not going to stop either. Well, not that we can stop it. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but we have, to, we have to approach it wisely with intention, okay? Then that brings us up to present day which some people are beginning to call the experience age. So we're all ready to, to transition from the information age to the experience age. The experience age means that we're no longer content with just chatting to our friends via IM. It's not the information we want. It's the emotional connection. That connection comes through sophisticated and integrated platforms that promote video sharing, photo sharing, and even the use of emojis. Users want to be able to convey meaningful thoughts, feelings, and jokes through their interactions. And these days, that nearly always includes a visual component, okay? Now, it's called the experience age, but let's take a look at this next picture. Tell me who in this photo is actually experiencing whatever's happening. Grandma, right? Grandma is. Now, I'm sure the people with their smartphones would argue that they're also experiencing it, but remember, the digital technology requires interaction and sharing, okay? So I don't know, I don't know what's happening, Something exciting is happening, or someone is there, right? And everyone's experiencing it. But look at how the older generation experiences it, right? You can see the, you can see the contentment on her face. She's really, she's just enjoying the moment. Everyone else has what? Something in between them and whatever's happening. Something's come in between them. They have, they have a, a media, okay? So I think it's ironic, but there's just a di there's a difference in generations today. So when we think of Facebook, parents, I'm sorry to break it to you, but we think of the older generation, okay? Most kids today don't use Facebook anymore. The idea is Facebook is based on accumulation, okay? Well, at least when it started. They, they're obviously trying to adapt, and, and they're changing. We'll talk about actually a little bit about that later. But we have a timeline, so we can go back and see everything that we've, you know, we've posted, we, we accumulated, these, uh, these timestamps. We, we create albums. We create these photo albums, right, of our vacation, our trips, our special events, whatever it is. We accumulate all of these things, and it's information-based, right? You can go back. You can refer to it. Other people can see it. You know, they can comment if they want, or they can just click a thumbs up if they want. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, but, then, but then there's Snapchat, which actually, honestly, I don't even know if kids still used to that. I, I when it first came out, and I was I was in uh, I was teaching the high school. I tried it for like thirty seconds, and I was like, "No, nah, I'm done with this." Okay, like I cannot keep up with it, right? But Snapchat usually refers to the younger generation. It's instant. It's fleeting. You snap in the moment. You share it with someone. They can only see it for so long, right? So there's there's an aspect of secrecy to it. But that's not the only point of it. The point is you have to enjoy it, and you can't accumulate it like you can on Facebook. Right? Um, <clears throat> it's experienced base. You have to be in the moment to experience it. And I know that sounds silly when you're on your phone and like this, like that, like grandma's in the moment, right? We would all say that grandma's in the moment in this picture. But that's just not how it is for kids. But it turns out that we're living in a transitional phase of history. Again, remember, we're going from digital immigrants to digital natives. 
And eventually, when us parents are all dead and gone, it'll just be digital natives, right? And then as the experience age continues to grow, um, your kids will have a whole new set of problems to deal with, all right? So take comfort in that, all right? <laughs> but as we navigate this present uh, digital age, um, we have to understand some laws of the digital land, all right? So there's Moore's Law. Uh, it's the principle that the speed and capability of computers can be expected to double every two years as a result of increases in the number of transistors a microchip can contain. What that basically means is technology gets better, faster, smaller, cheaper, okay, every year. It's just, it's just headed in that direction. We have the law of accelerating returns. This says that evolutionary systems like information technology produce exponential changes. This happens because one generation of technology builds on and accelerates the returns of past generations. All right, so take a look at this, this headline here. Oh, we lose it. There we go. Take a look at this headline. Gutenberg, meet Grunewald. App Builder's U version puts Bible in half a billion phones. Okay? So we talked about Johann Gutenberg, who invented the printing pe press. Bobby Grunewald is a, a staff member at Life Church um, based out in Oklahoma. They developed the U version Bible app. How many of you use U version? All right. Awesome. That's great. That's a great way to use technology. I, I wouldn't say it replaces your physical Bible, but. Um, but, but here we have this app being downloaded in half a billion phones. 500 million people have been exposed to the Bible. And that's just the version app. There's, there's dozens of other Bible apps out there. Okay? To put this achievement into perspective, listen, that is more readers of the Bible than the total population of the world when Gutenberg revolutionized the world with his printed Bible around 1454. There were only like 390 million people in the world when the printing press came out. And now, because of technology, because of this law of accelerating returns, the Bible has been put into half a billion people's hands. Do you know how many Bibles Gutenberg printed? Let's hear some guesses. A thousand, okay. One? Somewhere in between there. <laughs> 30? 180. 180 Bibles, okay? That's enough for everybody in this room and then maybe a, maybe a few more, okay? Compared to half a billion Bibles, all right? That's crazy. Not all technology is bad, it's, but it's definitely changing. We have the law of accelerating change. Uh, it's a perceived increase in the rate of technological change throughout history, which may suggest faster and more profound change in the future and may or may not be accompanied by equally profound social and cultural change. Right? So things are changing faster, and past technology builds on present technology, which is laying the foundation for future technology, and it grows, and then it, and it impacts uh, society and culture as well. Take a look at this, at this chart. This is mass use of inventions. So these are years until a quarter of the U.S. population started using it, okay? So the telephone, right? That was a pretty big invention. So it took almost, let me see, 10, 20, 30, 40, about 40 years for only a quarter of the U.S. population to start using it, all right? And then you can see how the scale goes from radio to television to PC to the mobile phone to the web, which it only took about seven years for a quarter of the U.S. population to implement using the Internet. And you can, you can bet that that graph is going to continue to grow if whatever, whatever comes next. Okay? Andy Crouch, author of The TechWise Family, said this, the pace of technological change has surpassed anyone's capacity to develop enough wisdom to handle it. Right? It's coming at us faster than we know what to do with it. And, and faster than we can study its effects on us or manage its effects on us, right? Not only is new technology adopted faster than past technology, but it has evolved to the point where people are required to use it to adapt to society, all right? Again, you think of cars. You need a car to get most places or some sort. You don't, maybe you don't have to own one, right? But public transportation, whatever. Email. Have you ever tried doing anything, signing up for anything without an email address? It's pretty hard, 
right? I mean, it's possible. Like, you could use your wife's email, I guess. I mean, <laughs> but someone needs an email address, right? Smartphones. Again, it, you almost have to use, you have to adopt this technology to adapt to society. Now, you could go out and live in the woods off the land, and that's possible, but then you're no longer a part of society, right? That's kind of the idea. Society is, is requiring us to adopt these new technologies. There's the law of amplification. And so this is, so, as I was preparing for this, this is actually a, a thought that I had or I was, I was beginning to, to write ideas down. And then it, within the research I came across, there's actually a law of amplification. I was just thinking about how tech amplifies everything. But the law of ampl- amplification says technology's primary effect is to amplify human forces. Technology cannot transcend existing social forces, nor can it transform existing intentions. It tends to amplify whatever tendencies are already in place. Okay, so this this is really this uh, this is really prevalent in uh, social media. Okay, so technology amplifies. Um, things have gotten faster for sure. You think of like horse and buggy, um, and now we have vehicles. It amplifies the speed where you can get around. I mean, now you can be on the other side of the world in, in less than a day, right? It amplifies highs and lows. So just this week, no joke, I was just I was flicking through Twitter, and I saw a lady. I don't know who she was. I don't follow her, so someone else either liked it or retweeted it or Twitter suggested it to me. But she had posted about how her five-year-old son had passed away unexpectedly the day before, right? And so... There's this moment in this lady's life, I have no idea who she is, but because of technology, it's amplified that message. And so now I'm, you know, I'm heartbroken for, for this lady. I don't know who she is. No joke, I, sw- I, I flick the screen a couple more times, and there's another lady who's posting about her pregnancy announcement. I have no idea who she is. I don't follow her on Twitter, but somehow it got recommended to me. <clears throat> and so here we have these highs and lows of life that are being amplified because of technology. If you think about it, acceptance or rejection, we have these online communities where everyone is accepted, right? For good or for bad. Not all online communities are good, by the way. Uh, actually, I would probably say most are bad, but um, right. But it, but it amplifies that. You, you don't have to go and feel awkward and try to meet new friends and fit in at whatever lunch table um, at school. Uh, but it also amplifies rejections, right? We're, we're all we've all heard the horror stories of online bullying. Where it's, where it's ultimately led to, to some kids um, committing suicide. And, and, and the thing that's going on up in Michigan, right? I don't even know all the details up there, but from what I know, it's, everything's been amplified because of technology. We have progress and distractions, right? We have machinery and computing programs uh, that can help us uh, be more productive and accomplish more and move things faster along. But we also have YouTube rabbit holes that suck us in and keep us from doing our homework or whatever we're supposed to be we're supposed to be working on. Technology amplifies the truth and lies. Um, just ask either side of the political aisle, right? Everything from their side is true, but everything from the other side is a lie, right? It doesn't matter who you ask, but lies and truth are both amplified. Communication and confusion. Now it's easier to communicate with anybody than it ever has been. Email, text, social media. Um, but also there's a lot of confusion that comes in that because you don't have the clear communication in person with body language and the tone of your voice and all of those things, right? So um, technology amplifies both. And then, I mean, let's get spiritual. We have the gospel and wickedness, okay? In an instant, you can share the gospel to the world through the internet, right? I mean... It, I mean, right now, we could all pull our phone out right now and in 30 seconds explain the gospel and then upload it to Facebook, to Instagram, to Smackchat, to Spacebox, whatever the kids are, whatever the kids are using these days, okay? Uh, right? We can, we, can sh- we, we can share the gospel. We can, uh, man, it's easier, easier, and I, I say it from the, the comfort of my own home, but to send missionaries across the world, right? So just this week, Troy was talking to Kale, our missionary in Hungary, Right? And uh, he's able to talk to him like that because of technology, but we're also able to get Kale over there. He's able to learn the language, all adapt all those things because of technology. Um, and then I don't have to I don't have to tell you about the infinite evil and wickedness that's only a click away. Technology amplifies. Now let's look at the future. Okay, let's look at the future. The future of technology will continue to move in the same direction it has been at a faster pace than it ever has. 
All right, that's again, that's the, those are the laws that we looked at, and so that's what the future holds. Uh, just some examples: we look at virtual reality. Uh, if you look at Facebook and Zuckerberg and uh, the new metaverse, some of you guys have seen any of that, but you can look into that uh, and you can see how that's uh, how technology's changing that. Um, there was a there was a TED talk on YouTube. It's called "The Dawn of the Age of Holograms" by Alex Kipman. Um, you know, he was talking about how. Man, this 2D technology media isn't enough for him. Um, let's, let's really connect with people and move it in, basically into the world of virtual reality holograms where I'm like, well, why don't you just go talk to, why don't you go have coffee with the person? Like, it's, again, so media, media is coming in between us. It's, it's in the middle, right? And so all of, these function, all of these things function to remove us from actual reality, okay? That is what's so silly to me. Oh, I'll, I'll try to find the picture, but there's some toy coming out this Christmas season. You guys know what a Peloton bike is, right? So, you know, it's an it's a exercise bike, basically, uh, which, you know, instead of using a real bike. But uh, not only that, this exercise bike has a giant screen on front of it. Well, they have little tykes, I think it was, came out with something. I think it's called Pelican or something like that, which is a little kid's exercise bike that you stick an iPad to. Teach your kid how to ride a bike, for Pete's sake, right? <laughs> It's ridiculous. But in the name of connection, it actually replaces true human connection. It comes between us. Technology has always been better at communication than it has connection. Some things cannot be fabricated, but that doesn't mean they're not going to try. Uh, a couple years ago, I was listening to a podcast. I remember it was the TED Radio Hour podcast, and I can't remember exactly which one or else I'd, 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 uh, I'd tell you. But they were talking about tech and how it's good at anticipating behavior and recommending ads. And they gave this example of a Target campaign where they were, um, uh, th they were tracking this one young girl's purchases and searches and all that. And, um, and they started sending her ads for baby items. And she was like 14 or 15 or something like that. She was young. And uh, so dad got mad. And he calls up Target, like, why are you sending my daughter these things? Like, oh, you know, we're, we're so sorry, or whatever. Well, what had happened is they had developed uh, an algorithm that, based off of your searches and your purchase history and all that, then, they, then they, they're able to do enough of these and realize that, well, this lady must be pregnant. She's expecting a baby, yada, yada, all right? And so lo and behold, this young girl was pregnant, but she didn't even know it. But Target knew it before she knew it, Right? And so it's gotten good, technology has gotten good at, um, I lost my spot here, sorry, uh, at identifying these um, and, and anticipating our behavior and, and recommending these things, but, but this, what, what I was saying is this podcast was talking about how it still lags in identifying emotion and reading feelings, okay? And so they were hoping that in the future they'd be able to remedy this by recognizing and analyzing nuanced facial expressions and subtle tones in your voice to be able to offer help if you want it, right? That will effectively eliminate the need for a friend or a loved one to sit across from you and listen to you and pray with you and offer encouragement to you and touch you, give you a hug, right? You cannot replace that, but technology sure is trying, Keeping in touch with someone and reaching out to touch someone are two different things. Exodus 33, 11 tells us this, that um, when the Lord spake unto Moses, he spoke to him face to face as a man speaketh unto his friends. So if you want to know how, we, how we're to communicate with our friends and our loved ones, now again, there's obviously times to, you can text, you can FaceTime, you can talk on the phone, whatever. But you cannot replace face to face with the people you love. Proverbs 27.10, right? You think of uh, these um, tragedies in someone's life, right? Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity in these tragedies, these hard times. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother that is far off, right? You can't replace human interaction, human connection. And I get worked up on these things because it seems as though the forces of technology are working to replace the need for the church, for our families, for each other. And to the lost world, it replaces their need for a Savior. It gives them no purpose, no hope. <clears throat> and here's the danger. The danger is the church is more accepting of this direction now more than ever. 
During the pandemic, we canceled our in-person services for a time and we live streamed our messages. Tech was helpful for a time. Not all tech is bad. But there were some church leaders out there who said that this proved that church can be done online. But I disagree. I believe it proved just the opposite. If you can experience church through a screen, then that is not a church, right? In your notes, it says virtual community is convenient, but is not what we were created for. Church is a gathering, a called out assembly, a local body. Neither of those things can be distant, can be separated, can have something in become, come between them. Satan is using technology to drive a wedge further and further between us. The gap between our relationship, relationships which, with each other and God has been filled with more and more technology and media to keep us satisfied and distracted. And that brings us to our last section of tech and religion. Technology will no longer be a means to an end, but I believe it's on track to be the focus of existence. There are Apple fanboys, and you, and you see, and I, <laughs> this hurts me because I know Andy is just loving this moment right now back there. All right? So... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Apple, okay? But you see these product releases, and they're, everyone there is so, they line up for hours. They're so emotional. They're, they're basically worshipful over these product releases. There is an, a cult like allegiance. Uh, they did a brain scan of a professed Apple evangelist, and Apple products fired, listen, Apple, the images of Apple products fired the same um, region of the brain as religious imagery. In a person of faith. A uh, guy to look into is Ray, Ray Kurzweil. His stated goal is to live forever. He basically wants to transfer his consciousness into a robot. Okay? Um, he talks a lot about the singularity. Elon Musk. I am very intrigued with this guy, Elon Musk. But you've heard of SpaceX, right? He's basically trying to reach heaven. Have you heard of Neuralink? Okay, so this is the idea where they implant this thing into your brain, and this is all very real. You can go, i I just referencing these, you can go look yourself, it's interesting, right? But you won't even need to talk to someone. Even if they don't know your language, you'll be able to, to the idea is to transfer your thoughts, right? Forget Google Translate, Neuralink is the, is the next thing, right? And this all points us to Genesis 11. All roads lead back to Babel. A society that flew in the face of God, determined to make their own way to heaven, SpaceX, find their own entrance into eternal life, Ray Kurzweil, which by the way, he made those, made keyboards. I mean, he's, he's a super smart guy. He's got his name right on there. Get rid of that. Cover that up. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, they want to find their own entrance to eternal life. They want to establish their own glory. And when God saw it, he, he said that nothing would be restrained from them that they imagined to do. That's the point where the Tower of Babel was. So you know what he did? He intervened, and he put a stop to it. Due to today's technological developments, we are headed in the same direction as Babel. And you know what God will do before it gets too far? He'll put a stop to it. But here's the thing. Technology and its impact on our world has always been about something more. Sorry, I'm going to fly through this so we can finish up. Uh, we look at the, revelation, uh, excuse me, the revolutions throughout history, the financial revolution. Money became a central part of society. What that does is it pulls on our affections. 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all evil. The industrial revolution allows us to make technological leaps. It's led to globalization, right? So where the, the world is basically a level playing field. It boosts our ability. There was the sexual revolution in the 1900s. There's a cultural shift in our thinking. It shapes our attitude. It's bolstered the postmodernism movement where I define my own truth. Satan has used each of these fronts to lay the groundwork for his purposes to magnify himself. It has always been about worship, seeking what was rightfully God's, lifting himself up. And now the next front where he is at work is the digital revolution in its current day. And it's a culmination of all these other areas because technology amplifies. The stage is set and Satan has a plan in place to suck us into his scheme and away from God's purpose. Ephesians 2.2 calls it the course of this world. I believe that this area of technology has always been Satan's platform. It's very clear from the Tower of Babel. There's even the belief that the culture back then was more advanced than the culture is now. And so while some would say that technology is neutral or amoral, I would tend to believe that the scale tips towards evil. I believe that because of the effects of technology today by simply using it. 
regardless of the content. And we'll get into that more next week. Not all tech is bad. It can be redeemed, but it takes work. It requires effort. It can be used for good. But I believe the wickedness it amplifies is seeking you out and seeking your children out. And you will have to actively work against it. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom he may devour. Satan's compared to a lion. It's no coincidence that lions will first attack the weak and the young. Parents, be sober. Be vigilant. Can I give you a personal example? So I was in high school, and back then emails were kind of a new thing, um, for us at least. So I got a personal email account, Hotmail. Who, st- who still has a Hotmail account? I feel you. All right, good for you. Hung on to it. This was really before we got hundreds of thousands of junk mail a day. And um, I received uh, an email, a junk mail, that I did not sign up for. I, it's, no one forwarded it to me. Um, I, it was just in my inbox. And in that email was a link to a pornographic website. Uh, I'd never searched for anything like that before. In fact, the only time I can remember seeing something like that before was when uh, my buddies stumbled across the HBO channel on our 8th grade Washington, D.C. trip. But the day I got the email was what Ephesians 6.13 calls an evil day. I wish I could say that I was able to stand against the temptation when it sought me out, but my curiosity and my flesh won out, and it began a battle that I would fight for years to come. Do you know what the average age a kid is exposed to pornographic content is today? Anybody? 11, some studies say as young as 8. And do you think that's because those kids are so worldly or corrupt that they deviously seek out those things? No. It's because media is designed to deceive and to lure you in. The God of this world is on the prowl. Parents, there's an attack on our children And the enemy's most effective weapon is media and technology. And we have allowed him behind enemy lines. He's in our homes, in our bedrooms, and in our pockets. So it's time that we wake up. And like we saw in Nehemiah 4 last week, let us fight for our sons. And our daughters. And our homes. Let's pray. Lord, we do come to you today and we're asking for your help. Uh, There is a a battle. Uh, There is an attack. And we can't handle it on our own. And so God, we're asking you to to work on our behalf, to to give us the wisdom and the guidance that we need to to protect our kids and to prepare them uh, for what the world holds. Um, And so Lord, we... we, uh, we just, re- we just really need your help. So I pray that through this class, God, that you would uh, open our eyes, make us aware, but also equip us to be able to handle that. And so I pray um, in the weeks to come that you would guide us and teach us. I pray for uh, all the parents and kids that are here today that, um, uh, that this would be a, a beneficial uh, class for them. And, and ultimately, Lord, we can, we can always go back to your church, to your spirit, and to your word. Uh, to teach us and to guide us. So, so help us to remember that. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll see you back here next week. If you didn't notice on the schedule, we'll have two weeks off. Um.